Let's pray. Father, as we come uh, this Christmas morning, we know that there are some here who have heavy hearts, maybe many who have heavy hearts. God, we remember those like Jeff who lost his mom and his uncle in the last week and a half. God, we pray comfort on their family. We pray that truth and grace would reign. We pray, Lord, that you would help them as they walk through the valley of the shadow of death. We pray that you would show great mercy to him, show you great mercy to his family. We also pray for those who are here today who have other losses that they, they grieve. Some of them are recent, like, like Jeff's. And some of them are a little while longer ago. Some are lonely. Some are missing loved ones. Some have broken relationships that this Christmas rem- reminds them are not healed. Some have loved ones who are lost. And so today, God, it's a day of celebration. We start by, re- by remembering those who, who struggle and limp along, limp their way into our church service, or maybe couldn't even bring themselves to come today. God, we pray that you would show them great mercy. We pray that you would give them hope from Luke chapter 1, where Mary reminds us that Jesus does not come for those who have it all together, but he comes for the, the outcast. He comes for those who mourn. He comes for the weak and the poor and the fearful. So today, God, we pray that this Christmas would be a Christmas for those in our, cong- in our church who, who, who struggle. God, we also we come today with so much to thank you for. We thank you uh, for the, the sweet, we, th- we thank you for the sweet things. We thank you for the sun that rises. We thank you for snow and for cold. We thank you for good memories and gifts that do come. God, we pray, we thank you for the family members that we do have and we get, that we get to celebrate. And God, we pray that this Christmas, we would direct our hearts from every good thing to the hand of the giver. And God, we pray today as we, uh, as we worship, we pray that your word would sink down deep into our hearts. What we don't need are the thoughts of, of men. We don't need... We don't need our own thoughts. We need you to come in from the outside, just as you did at Christmas, and tell us what's really going on. We need you to tell us what the deep needs of our heart are, and we need you to remind us through the gospel that you are you are the remedy that we need. You are the provision that we need. You are the shepherd who promises that everything that we need will come from your hand. We pray today in the songs that we sing, in the scriptures that are read, in the prayers that are prayed, and in the word that is preached, that we would hear from you. In Jesus' name, amen. This summer, we were returning from our vacation in Virginia. And when you've got a two-year-old, when the directions say, you can save between 30 minutes and an hour by going this route, you go, okay, 30 minutes with a two-year-old is a big deal. And so, so we, we decided to take the, these directions. And we, we did have a map. Thankfully, we had a map as well. Because I didn't know that Virginia and West Virginia and Maryland and Pennsylvania all kind of meet. And we ended up in this place, which the directions again say it's going to be faster to go this way. But I didn't realize it was going to take us 125 years back to do it. Because eventually, we end up finding ourselves going down a two-lane road with horses pulling wagons next to us. Not Amish folks, just like guys in cowboy costumes, going down the side of the road. And I told Emma, get me to an interstate. (laughs) This is not working very well. I don't know what's going to happen. We end up in a storm. The the mountains were kind of crazy as well. We would not take that route again. But we're going down this road, and eventually we just reach a point where I'm like, this is nice, and it's kind of pretty, and it's supposed to be short, but this is a disaster. So get me to a different road. I was thinking of that story this morning because sometimes in life we're going down a certain path and circumstances cause us to go, where in the world am I? What in the world am I doing? And God, is this really the direction that you called me to go? Really, I kind of think there's a couple different ways. Sometimes we get to a point where we say, God, is this really the job that you told me to take? I didn't realize it would be years with this much heartache. 
we go, God, I thought you called me to raise my kids in this way, but God, this has been heartache after heartache. God, what, what are we doing down this road? God, did I hear you right? Sometimes circumstances get us to a place instead where we just say, God, this is really dark here. God, I, what are we doing? In the, in the, where is the light to shine in this place? Sometimes circumstances get us to a place where we go, God, what's going on? What do you want from me here? Today we're looking in Matthew chapter 2 at one of those moments. Matthew chapter 2 is, is a passage where circumstances start calling on Joseph and start calling on God's disciples to go, wait, what is God up to and what does he want from me in the middle of this place? So turn with me to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. Today we're going to be looking at verses 13 to 23. Matthew chapter 2, verse 13. If you've got a Bible, you can follow along. If not, you can follow along on the screen above. Matthew chapter 2, verse 13. When they had gone, that is when the magi, when the wise men had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so it was fulfilled, and so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity, who were two years old and under in accordance with the time that he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Verse 19, after Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, get up, Take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel. For those who were trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled what was said through the prophet that he would be called a Nazarene. Let's pray. God, as we open your word here, help us to hear what you have to say to us in the life of Jesus, in the story of Joseph's response, and in Herod's vicious attacks against Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. This story starts with the scene of Joseph being warned in a dream. Joseph, it was revealed to Joseph that he should take Mary as his wife and that the baby that she had really was the child of the Holy Spirit, just as Mary had told him. Well, but this happens again that the, the wise men had been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, so they go in a different route. And then Joseph starts out in this dream. And what I want you to notice is in verses 13 to 15, the exact words that Joseph is commanded in the dream. Get up, take the child and his mother, and escape to Egypt are the exact words for what Joseph does. This happens multiple times here in this story, that the exact words that the angel tells him are the, are, is the exact description of what Joseph does. The angel says, get up, take the child. The description is, Joseph got up and took the child. It's exactly the same. And so Joseph starts out with a warning, and the emphasis is the fact that Joseph does what God calls him to do. Joseph would have been a poor man. We know that because the sacrifice that he had offered, that they had offered when Jesus was just born, was the sacrifice that a poor person was allowed to, take, to give rather than a, a rich person. But So Joseph gets up in obedience and does what God calls him to do. And repeatedly throughout the book of Matthew, because Matthew is written to Jewish Christians or to convince Jewish people that Jesus really is the Messiah, there is this, this theme throughout the book of Matthew that Jesus fulfills the Old Testament. And so it's repeated here. 
And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet. Out of Egypt I called my son. The second scene is in verses 16 to 18 where then Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, gets incredibly angry and orders that all of the boys in the vicinity of Bethlehem under the age of two be killed. Herod, it's, he's both furious and he's cruel. We know he's cruel because he killed his, one of his wives. He killed some of his sons. Herod was a vicious man. And here, because of the number of people that lived in the area, there were probably between 10 and 30 boys that were killed, which is no less brutal, like t- 10 children that are under the age of two or a thousand. It doesn't matter. Either way, Herod is brutal in having two-year-old boys put to death. There's so much in this that recalls G- Moses in the land of Egypt. Ordered to be killed by the, the word of Pharaoh, all the boys be killed, and Moses' life is spared. Well, here, Herod is furious. He orders all of the, bil- the children to be killed. And it says, and then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. This is a quotation from Jeremiah that's speaking about what the exile is going to be like when God's people are exiled. And here, that is fulfilled once more in the life of Jesus. That the, that the people in the land of Bethlehem are weeping and mourning, refusing to be comforted. The third scene comes to verse 19, verses 19 to 23, where The question begins, okay, so Jesus fulfills, out of Egypt I called my son, a prophecy from the Old Testament. Jesus again fulfills the word from Jeremiah of weeping and mourning over the loss of the children. But then it becomes a question, but the Messiah can't just be from Egypt. And so verse 19 to 23 explains, how does Jesus come to Nazareth? How does Jesus come to Nazareth? Again, an angel of the Lord appears in a dream to Joseph, says, get up, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel for those who were trying to take the child's life are dead. Verse 21 says, so he got up, took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Archelaus was even more unstable than his dad was. To the point that the Romans realized this guy is a disaster. And so they took the, took the throne away from Herod's son. They sent him to go live into what is now France. And then they gave the kingdom to Syria. They, they, they changed everything because his, the son was even more unstable and more brutal and more cruel than his dad was. And so it, but even in that, God used the, the, the wickedness, the instability, the, the, the craziness of Herod's son to cause Jesus to be taken to the district of Galilee. That's in the far north of Israel. That's a, a little backwater place to the town, to a town that's called Nazareth. It was a, it was a small town outside of a large city, not an Israelite city, but outside of a large city. And so a lot of people in that area would go and work like what we would now call construction jobs, go and work in the city and work construction jobs. That's the kind of town that Jesus was brought to, a no-name backwater town called Nazareth. We see later in the Gospels where one of the disciples says, can anything good come from Nazareth? That The story kind of ends with this dramatic, God is saving the life of the baby king. God is preserving him from Herod. And then he goes to to a hidden place called Nazareth. Verse 23 ends with, So was fulfilled what was said through the prophets that he would be called called a Nazarene. What I want to show you here today in these verses is that this passage is really about Jesus being preserved for God's purpose, but despised by humans. That's kind of the whole thing that's happening in this story is who is going to threaten what Jesus Nobody is going to threaten what God is doing, what the Father is doing in the life of the Christ, but humans are going to look down. The humans are going to despise Him. I want to show you today in these verses that this is a call to you and I to trust God and His purpose no matter the circumstances. That's what's happening here in the Christmas story. That's what Joseph is being invited to. Here, what I want to show you is three lessons in trust here at Christmas. Three lessons in trust this Christmas. First, this passage calls us to trust in God's purpose. 
Trust in God's purpose. I want you to notice the number of times that fulfilled is used here. Verse 15, and so was fulfilled what the Lord had said. Verse 17, then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. Verse 23, so was fulfilled what God, what was said through the prophets. Each one of these is saying that Jesus is not an accident. Him going to Egypt was not an accident. The, 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 the Lord used the grief of the people. That the, the Lord even used him going to a backwater, no-name town where nothing good ever happens for his purpose. He uses all of these things. Herod didn't intend to be used by God, and yet God was still working his purpose through Herod. Joseph didn't really know how all of this was going to turn out. I, I wonder at Christmas, I was wondering this last night as Em and I were watching a Christmas movie, I, wonder, I was like, I wonder how often Mary went, God promised a lot through this baby, but he did not promise I'll survive. Okay. To my knowledge, there are no promises in Matthew 1 and 2 or in Luke chapters 1 and 2 that anything in Mary's life is going to be amazing. And so... When she's going through birth, you guys know birth is a risky event. It's, it, it, it's an event where, where people die in childbirth all the time, even these, even these days, but especially in those days. It was a risky event, and I imagine Mary going, will I get to see this baby? Will this promise that God has said is coming true, will I get to experience it? I wonder in Joseph's life when he's like, Herod and his soldiers are after this baby. And God promised a lot in his life. But does that mean I'm going to get to see him grow up? But, but what Joseph is called to do is in, to trust that God is fulfilling his word and fulfilling his purpose in the Christ. That not only that he's going to fulfill his purpose, in the, he's going to fulfill all of his promises in the Old Testament. I think that's one of the sweet things in Joseph and Mary's life. Is that moment by moment, they get to see all of the promises of God are coming true. The one to Egypt, that's coming true. The, the, the one that he's going to be called a Nazarene, that he's going to be despised, that one is coming. They got a front row seat to the fact that God's purpose doesn't get stopped by the most powerful army in the universe or in the world. God is fulfilling his purpose for Israel. I mentioned earlier that there is so much in this story that recalls the story of Moses. That when God determines to rescue and save his people, Pharaoh in Egypt can't stop it. When God determines to, to rescue his people here in the new Moses, nobody is going to stop God's purpose. The promises of God are coming true. In these stories, it is a call to us that God's to trust in God's purpose. That if God's purpose is to send a shepherd ruler, then we can trust that whatever we are facing right now, God promises he's going to be a shepherd ruler for you right now. When, when he promises to save from sins, if you come here today weighed down by sin and guilt and shame, this we go, I did it again. That you can trust that God's purpose of saving you from your sins is true. If, if at Christmas the purpose of God is to be God with us, then here at Christmas we are invited like Joseph to get up and trust that God's purpose will be fulfilled. This story calls to you and I and says the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, has a purpose for the Son. And will we trust it? Will we trust that He is doing what he says he's going to do. And that not, will we trust him to do that? My family only ever bought one new car that I remember. And it was a, I think it was, it had to be 1989 or 1990. And do you remember when the Ford Tauruses were like the brand new thing? And everybody, and if you had a bunch of kids, you needed to get a wagon so that the, the other kids could turn around and Look out the back window. That's the only new car we ever had. It was, uh, I would now call it sand colored, tan, kind of a, a color. Occasionally you'll still see, it kind of makes me feel 
not, not as old as some of you feel, but it makes me feel old when I go, that's a 30-year-old car, and it looks new to me. Like, that was the only new car we ever had. And I remember going, we drove about an hour to get it, and I don't even know who these ladies were. My dad and I rode with these, like, three old ladies going to this town an hour away to a new car dealership and where we picked up the new car. And this is back when we still had bench seats in the front and kids got to sit up there, you know. So some kids got to face backwards and some people were in between mom and dad's elbows. Well, so in this front, front bench seat, we get the car. I'm about five years old, no more than six. And it was time to go home, but it was about like, it was about like afternoon. And so I don't know why my dad was like, you're going to fall asleep. So why don't we recline the front seat, uh, your, your, the passenger seat, and you can sleep on our way home. And I remember just very clearly, he reclines the seat and says, sit down. So I get in the front seat. I sit down. And he's like, now lean back. And I remember being deathly afraid. Like, I thought there was nothing back there anymore. And so I would get to this point, and I was like, I'm not going back anymore. And he, dad was like, there's a back back there. Lean back. And I just, re- I remember going, it feels like I'm about to fall off the edge of the earth. Like, and so we just kept going back and forth. There was like five to ten minutes of dad saying, like, you're going to take a nap, lean back. And I just remember kind of rocking back to this point and getting afraid and putting my hands out like I was going to fall. So we eventually, we, 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 dad figured out a strategy that instead of starting out with the seat lean back, he would start out with the seat all the way upright. And he would say, lean back. And then he would pull the lever, and we could, I could, like, recline in the seat. I still don't remember falling asleep, but this was somehow very important. That's why we spent 10 minutes on it. But somehow it was really important. I just remember driving back in the first time in this new car in the front seat looking at the ceiling um, after this 10-minute ordeal where I couldn't trust at first that there was a seat back back there. It, it was such a, a strange circumstance. I'd never been reclined in a car before didn't know this car at all, and so somehow I had to get adjusted so that I could trust that I wasn't going to fall backwards and hit my head in this car. I was thinking of that story because this passage is calling you and I to get so used to the purpose of God that we can trust it. I had, I had somehow, I couldn't just trust that the seat was back there. And so he had to bring the seat up close so then I could slowly trust it a little bit more and more and more. This Christmas, this passage is calling you and I to get up close with the purposes of God so that when life gets hard, that we can trust Him. They're not so strange, and we don't wonder what's back there. It is a call to us to say, this is the purpose of God. And I am going to keep that so close to my mind and my heart that in 2023, no matter what happens, I am leaning on the purposes of God, trusting that He is going to do what He promised. So this passage calls you and I to get to know the character and purpose of God so well that we can trust Him. Second thing, this pas- the second lesson in trust from this passage this Christmas. This passage calls us to trust that nobody stops God's purpose. I want you to notice what Herod is doing here. Notice what Herod is doing. Herod gave orders to kill all of the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity. Herod was trying to kill Jesus. And if we read the rest of the Gospels, the Father had a purpose To put that son to death. Herod was trying to do the will of God in his own strength, in his own way, in his own time, and for his own purpose. And the father says, yes, the father is, or the son is going to die, but not according to your plans, according to mine. Not for your purpose, but for mine. Herod cannot kill Jesus here. You see, Jesus is going to die, but not on Herod's terms. Jesus is going to die, but not on Herod's purpose. The Lord is the one who is doing this. And so Herod does not get to disturb or disrupt or delay the purpose of God for the Son. 
there's actually two ways that Herod has spoken here that I love in, in, uh, in Matthew chapter 2. It says two times in verse 15. Uh, I'm sorry, it says in verse 13. Uh, stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. Then verse 14 and 15, where he, uh, Joseph goes to Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. Another way of, comp- of putting that is t- until Herod is ended. Herod was ended in verse 15. But it happens again in verse 19, where it says, after Herod died. It, there, it, it's actually a strange word for die, because it's normally a word for ended. It, it it, it kind of, if, if we'll slow down and notice, this whole story is Herod trying to end the purpose of God, end what God is up to, and yet Herod is the one who is ended. And so this, the central part of this story is to call to you and I and say, nothing and no one stops what God is up to. Not the most powerful man in the land. Not the richest man in the land. Nobody stops what God is up to. And that's ultimately what we see in the story of the Bible, right? You see, Rahab's past doesn't stop the purpose of God. Ruth's widowhood doesn't stop the purpose of God. Ruth's ethnicity doesn't stop the purpose of God. Nebuchadnezzar's power and riches doesn't stop the purpose of God. Daniel living in exile doesn't stop the purpose of God. Nehemiah's opponents don't stop the the purpose of God. Jonah's disobedience doesn't stop the purpose of God. The story of the Bible is about people and events and things happening to people that makes us seem like, God, what are you up to? But in these circumstances, God is showing us, ultimately here in the baby Jesus, nobody stops what I'm up to. So it is a call to you and I. To, to begin to look at the world and say, nobody is going to stop what God is up to in my life in 2023. Not my husband, not my wife, not my kids, not my grandkids, not my parents, not my history, not what I did, not what was done to me, not what this next year holds, not what the next decade holds. There is no past that's going to stop what God is up to. And at Christmas, it is a call to say that God is up to something. Look for it. Trust it. Lean on it. Get used to it. Stop believing that Herod Herod can somehow stop what God wants to do. I think this passage calls you and I to take time today, take time this week, begin to prepare for 2023, to meditate on the purposes of God, looking back on our lives and and telling the story over our lives that nothing back there stopped what God is up to. Begin to spend time looking forward at this next year and say there is nothing out here that is going to stop what God is up to. That's one of the reasons that we encourage Bible reading and prayer, meditating on Scripture. Some people in our church reading through the whole Bible. Some people reading through the New Testament this year. It is a time for us to begin to look at the world and say, nothing stops what God is doing. The third lesson that we learn in trust here at Christmas is trust when you're tempted to despise. The the strangest part of this story is verse 22 and 23, that tells us how Jesus came to Nazareth. Because it says, so was fulfilled what was said through the prophets that he would be called a Nazarene. Because there's no, there is no literal wording saying that the Messiah is going to come from Nazareth. It's a strange thing if we're looking for that in the, in the same way that we're looking for the prophecy uh, in Jeremiah. If we're looking at some of the other prophecies that are fulfilled. Because this is a prophecy, this is, it, the reason is because in this time, to be a Nazarene was to be despised. It was to be from the other side of the tracks. It was to be, it was to be from a worthless place. This was like, why would anybody want to be from Nazareth? And why would anybody want to say that? That's the sense of this is how could the Messiah be from Nazareth? 
And here, God, through Matthew, is saying, Jesus came to Nazareth because the Old Testament tells us that the Messiah, that the Christ, that God's promised one would be despised. And here's one of the ways it ended up. Because he ended up in a place that nobody would look for a king from there. Nobody would look for a king from this place. And so all of this answers this question, how does Jesus end up in Nazareth? Why does Jesus end up in Nazareth? Because God takes the despised things and turns them for his own glory so that nobody else can say, well, of course, I would have done it that way. This tells us about Jesus. One of the stories of his whole life is that he would be despised and rejected. Moments where he is despised and rejected by his own family. Despised and rejected by the Jewish leaders, by the teachers of the law, by the priests, by the Romans. Jesus would be despised and rejected, would gather around himself people also that are despised and rejected, including Matthew who writes this. Nobody would want to be friends with a, with a cheat and a, with, and a disloyal citizen like Matthew. And so right here, we are called to begin to look at Jesus and say, in our flesh, we would despise this man. In our despise, we would not go this way. God has a purpose. Nobody stops it. How did it end up in that town? This is a call to you and I this Christmas to begin to see that God uses the despised for his plans. God uses the weak in his plans. God uses those with a limp. God uses those in despair and depression. God uses those with anxiety. God uses the long route. God uses the hidden. The routes that we wouldn't plan on going. The stories about ourselves and our families that we wish we didn't know. It would have been easier if we didn't know that part of the story. Here in the book of Matthew, God says, don't despise that place. As hard as it is to trust in the purpose of God in those, those lean years, in those long routes, in those hidden places, Matthew says, don't despise those places because that's where God's from. Ultimately, isn't that what we see in, in Zechariah and Elizabeth too? They have such a cool part of the, the Christmas story. They get to have the baby John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin. She gets to recognize that Mary's pregnant. It's awesome. But think about all the lean years where Zachariah and Elizabeth say, God, what did we do to deserve this? God, we wanted a baby. God, is it too much to ask? And there's so many years where Zachariah and Elizabeth feel forsaken by God in a place that they would never choose to go through. And then when they get to Christmas, they end up realizing God was actually there too. We didn't realize he was in the lean years. We didn't realize he was in the empty womb. We didn't realize that the promises of God were still in effect. It is a call. Christmas is a call to you and I to join Zechariah and Elizabeth and say, hey, this is a place where everybody else, including me, would despise. But because I know and love the purposes and promises of God, I am going to trust him even in this wilderness, even in this desert, even in the lean years, even in this long route. Don't despise what he's doing in your life. Don't despise and say, God, well, you could, there's a different route. There's a better way. Christmas says God knows the right direction. He knows the right pace. And He knows the right time. Don't despise the long routes and the dead ends. Don't despise the weakness. Because Christmas says that God is going to accomplish His purpose. Even if the world despises it. So this, this Christmas is a call to you and I to begin to look at our own lives in a new way. Get used to the promises of God, trusting the purpose of God. Believing that nobody's going to slow down His purpose and not despising the weakness and the difficulty. This is God's law for you today. His command is that all people trust in Him. And yet, we have not trusted Him. Even this week, you will stop trusting God's plans to do your good and you're going to follow to anxiety, to worry, to doubt, to fear, to despair, and to bitterness. 
this week, you may think that God does not plan good for you, so you pursue your own desires and your own lusts. This week, some of us will think that God must have lost control, and so we will take things into our own hands to control and shape the world to our own liking. You will lash out in anger. Maybe you will despise how God is working in your life and grow bitter with life and with people and ultimately with God. This is God's standard for us. We cannot lower it. Who can save us? This Christmas, Jesus stands up and says, I will. You see, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 13 says that Jesus trusted the Father. Which means that if you are in Christ, that is your record this Christmas. And Hebrews goes on to say that Jesus now ever lives to help those who are tempted this week. Tempted this week to not trust, tempted this week to grow bitter, tempted to stay in bitterness and in anger and in fear and anxiety. So if you are in Christ this week, you face God's command with Jesus' record and with Jesus' help. That is good news at Christmas. That is good news at Christmas. Look to Jesus and trust his plans, trust his record, trust his power, and trust his methods. Look up to Jesus If you are in Christ, but maybe you're here today and you say, what does that even mean? Let me speak for a moment to those that today you have never, you don't even know what it means to be in Christ. You feel the weight of your sin, the fact that you're separated from God, and that you need to be saved. Let today be the day that you embrace Jesus for the first time. The Bible says that all of us face the judgment of God. Guilty because of what we have thought and what we have done and by the things that we have left undone. But instead of leaving us in that place, Jesus came and lived the life that we should live, died the death that we should die, so that everybody who repents of sin and trusts in Jesus, that's it. Not those who are baptized, not those who give enough, not those who volunteer, not those who serve, those who accept and open their hands at his gift. Repent and take Jesus only to save them. That you can have the record of Jesus and then you can know that God's purpose for you is firm forever. That Jesus' record for you is perfect. And that God's power keeps working in every circumstance. If that's you today, come and grab me. Grab me while we sing. I want to help you make sure that you understand what it means to trust in Jesus. And so this passage It speaks to all of us today, calling us to trust in God's purpose no matter the circumstances. I want you to imagine, I want you to imagine what changes in your life when this becomes true. Maybe you're a kid to hear today, and you think through what life is like at school, and you think through what life is like at home. Imagine what changes in that place when you begin to realize that God is intending good for me even here at school, even here in my home, even with what's going on in my home and in my family. God intends good for me. Get used to that. Imagine what changes as you get used to that and trust that. Imagine what happens in your family when you realize that this, when you begin in your family to trust in God's purpose, no matter the bills that come in the mail, no matter the news that comes to you, imagine what happens Imagine what happens when you begin to realize in your extended family, God is not surprised by what what my dad did, by what my mom did. God God knew exactly and he intended to do good for me even in that. Imagine what happens for your dreams or for your waiting when you begin to realize nobody can slow down what God plans on for me. We, we, you, seem, you feel like you're waiting on your dreams. You feel like you're waiting on God's, and you go, God, what are you doing here? Imagine what changes when you begin to realize, in, even in that waiting, that nobody can stop God's purpose. Let's pray. God, as we come this Christmas, I pray that we as a people would get so used to your promises that we can trust them when life gets so hard. In Jesus' name, amen.